The world of Dragon's Dogma contains many mysteries and secrets that most of us never even knew existed. And just like with Super Mario 64, Minecraft and others, there is an iceberg that visually shows these secrets, created by Reddit user Ghanavan. And this video would not be possible without the help and knowledge of the Dragon's Dogma community. Special thanks go to the Pawn Pawn, Fly Out Fate, Gemma Lady, Carathrax, and Reddit user Jepards. Also a big thank you to the Dragon's Dogma Fandom Wiki and everyone who contributes for the supplementary materials and references that clarified much of the following. Some of these mysteries are still unsolved and I hope that this video will once more spark the community's interest to search for answers. Why is there no moon in the night sky? Are there hidden elves and dwarfs in Grancis? And did Solomon really die? Or is he alive and closer than we might think? Today we will try to start unraveling some of the mysteries and secrets that are presented here. Starting at the top of the iceberg. There is a cave in Pesardis if you travel down the well. But a tomb would suggest a vault for burying the dead, which cannot be found here even in the deeper parts of the cave. This might actually refer to the gravestone you can find in a small cave outside the chief's house. Its location then would suggest a family member or other close loved one of Doro. It is not stated however and cannot be definitively concluded. So either way it is a mystery. Though not touched upon within the game, the legend behind the ogre is that a tribe of giants was cursed by the gods long ago and they ended up like this. The warts on their bodies calcified to the point where they looked like short knobby horns. This probably refers to the mystic knights you fight here. Strangely, this is the only place you encounter these enemies while they're alive. Perhaps this is where the first mystic knights trained and originated from. It's worth noting that both Lord Julian and Sir Raph are mystic knights as well but neither use any vocation abilities like the enemies in the manse. Skeleton lords are undead mystic knights and can be found elsewhere, and silver knights and living armor are mystic knight enemies on Bitter Black Isle. It is possible to gain access to the upper level of the bell tower in the abbey, but there is nothing to be found here. Maybe it's cut content and we could ring the bell here originally. Most likely, it was an area planned to be reached early in development but was scrapped shortly after being designed and textured, leaving a large empty room with nothing but a mystery. These rooms can also be found in the churches of Casardis and Grand Sorn. We can find three cursed carvings in the close proximity to the abbey. These are false idols found only in the wilted forests and are favorite gifts of the members of the faith. But what are these idols, and where did they come from? The DLC quest Journey to the Rotting Wood give us some insight. The description suggests a necromancer once lived here and used these cursed carvings to summon the undead. That would explain why members of the faith want these, to study them and cleanse them of evil spirits. And as archaeologists settled close to ancient ruins for research, the members of the faith have settled here, close to the source of undead spawns and evil spirits. Nettie says the duke has had a lot of wives, but no heir. This is brought to light in the quest Arousing Suspicion, which suggests the duke abuses and kills his wives. One suggestion from the community is that it's part of his bargain, that he should never be allowed to love or have romantic companions and the killing of his wives is literally beyond his control. It could also simply be grief and madness overtaking him as he compares every wife to the woman he traded for his power. Mountebank is the owner of the shady shop in Grand Soren called the Black Cat. He is very suspicious of the Duke and believes that the texts we search for are just fiction, made up by some ancient self-important noble. 
his reason appears to be that no one knows who wrote them or why, and so no one can say if they are fact or fantasy. His name is a reference to the antiquated term mountebank, which was a charlatan or deceiver who would trick others out of their money. How much this refers to him or to his insight into others is a matter of debate, but his prices can be rather steep for suboptimal equipment. Although you can make forgeries of wake stones, they will lose their magical effect and be rendered useless in the process. The Maker's Finger is a powerful and expensive arrow that can instantly kill most enemies. The arrow is ineffective against humans and pawns and will pass straight through them, but using this to slay Grigori will result in the Arisen finishing the battle at the Tainted Mountain and completely skip the final boss destination, and potentially his loot drops. On your way to Grand Soren for the first time, you can kick the ox to make it speed up for a bit. Although this is commonly known by the community, I chose to leave this in for the record. There are four different ways the main questline can end, and three of these are considered the bad endings. If you sacrifice your beloved to become a duke like Edmund, you choose the solitude ending. You can choose the illusion for peace, or lose to the Seneschal to obtain the servitude ending where you become the dragon. Feste knows the secret about the duke, but because he is a court jester nobody believes him. In short, he tells you straight out that the duke does not intend to reward you or even tolerate your threat to his position. Alon in the ancient quarry sells two promissory notes, and seven days after purchasing both, the two miners within will open up two previously closed passages on the eastern and western branches. Though it's never stated and nothing can be done about it, the notes are heavily suggested to be from Madeline. Just like you can grapple and throw smaller foes, it's possible to pick up animals and throw them to your pawns, and sometimes they will actually catch them and throw them back at you. There is no visible moon in the night sky because it was cut from the final version of the game. This picture shows the conceptual diagram of the world as it was originally intended. Parallel worlds are stacked above and below each other, with one sun per world. However, the moon would have been shared between all users. Gameplay-wise, it would have served as the final boss location where we would fight the guardian of the world. In your second or later playthrough, if you are in online well, mode, the last person who killed the Seneschal will be sitting on the throne. If you are in offline mode, however, you will actually meet your previous Arisen as the Seneschal. The armor sets for Guts and Griffith from the manga and anime series Berserk were made available for players to buy from Alon in the quarry thanks to a collaboration between Capcom and Berserk Golden Age Arc Films. Sadly, these are not available in the updated release of Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen due to the expiration of their licensing agreement. In your first post-game, you will have to enter through the Everfall to get to the Ur Dragon. But if you're in New Game Plus, you can use the Rift Zone on Kasardis Beach to go directly to the Chamber of Lament. In the post-game, there's a Wyvern where you defeated the Griffin and Solomon. This dragon is linked to the element of thunder, just like the griffin, and, according to legend, the blue moon tower may also have been built to honor one of the old gods of sky and air. Bodric is, at first glance, a tramp, though it seems he was once a scholar, who had some sort of experience relating to his research during his former life. His dialogue is very different from other NPCs, and it seems he knows that all of this is a simulation, and in his statements he breaks the fourth wall by directly referring to the player. Though not much is known about the old religion, two man-made places are confirmed associated with it. These are the catacombs for Earth and the Water God's Temple for Water. One other man-made structure appears to be contemporary with them the Blue Moon Tower. Pawns will state that it was built by a forgotten lord for an unknown purpose, but many hints suggest it was, or at least became, a place to worship the air god. 
further, this all leaves fire out. One place, however, practically spells itself out for us. The Flame Servant's Throne, at the base of Everfall. I have never experienced any bugs during the Griffin fight, but some people have mentioned some camera problems during the chase sequence. The Worm King's Ring provides a slight bonus to casting speed while you have it in your inventory. You can give a forgery to the Duke to complete the quest, but in turn he will not be able to open the chest with your reward. During the quest A Parting Gift, Abbess Clarus requests that Arisen acquire a pilgrim's charm from the catacombs to give to Kina before she leaves. She meets the Arisen at the catacombs and can enter the dungeon with them. She will stay in the catacombs for a while after the quest ends. During the quest Land of Opportunity, Pip will run off. He will be found on top of the barn in the craftsman quarter and can be reached by jumping from the rooftop of the adjacent building. After talking to him, he disappears from the rooftop shortly after. If spoken to before taking on Grigori, the Duke will have the following to say. To challenge the dragon is to challenge Edmund Dragon's power. A hint that he does not want you to usurp his power and that every task he gave you was to lead you astray. If you grab on to one of the harpies in Blue Moon Tower, the flight can take you to a hidden area that contained treasure. The Duke is under a lot of stress. He's extremely terrified that Arisen will dethrone him, or that his dark past will be revealed. Between that and always regretting the choice he made, Edmund suffers excessive hair loss. And you can actually gather up a lot of his hair from behind his seat in the solar. There is a golem and a sword in a stone, but no apparent tomb. There are also a number of unusual standing stones, and it's unknown if they are natural or placed by someone else. The name is likely a reference to the real-world tomb of the unknown soldier. Festa is usually found either sitting in the Duke's throne, prancing up and down in the dungeon, or lying on the floor in a side room on the ground floor of the keep, most likely to annoy the castle cleaners. Along the rock wall of the fallen city is a building with a balcony just out of reach. It has an invisible wall protecting it as well, so you can't use the dragons to get to it, rendering it inaccessible. Too high to reach, it appears to be lit by lanterns, and it's a highly intriguing spot. We can find many shortcuts in caves like Soul Flayer Canyon that are geographically impossible. Bitter Black Island has them intentionally, but that trope is justified. The eradication site battle appears somewhat recent, but most likely not very noteworthy. Given the area inhabitants, it was most likely the drake hunting oxen or goblin for a meal, and the goblins fought back, however briefly as cornered rats do since at the time they probably couldn't reach any other safe haven. Alon is the quarry quest giver, but he is not found by the quarry pre-ox cart. Instead, he can be found inside the abbey, where he sells basic gear and weapons for all vocations. And you can also buy the promissory notes from him here very early in the game. There is a theory that the Tainted Mountain City was once inhabited by the Dragonforged. But it seems the rumor is false, since it already existed during Savon's time, and the Dragonforged was made arisen by Grigori many ages after. During his quest, Valmiro disappears, like other more official beloved choices do. This, however, is a simple consequence of his traveling off in a boat, but he does come back when he is your beloved. In this area, there is an ore deposit that gives you a demon's periapt and a weapons pile that can give you a sorrow stone. This is apparently just a programming error. In the original plans for the game, beyond Witchwood would be an elven sanctuary, and this is also hinted at in the character creator since pointed elven heirs are a cosmetic option. The undead's dialogue seems to reveal the way they died, which suggests they aren't really attacking but trying desperately to cling on to their lost life. Perhaps most heartbreakingly is the mother who died searching for in defense of or giving birth to her child. It's possible she is also a reference to La Lorona, or the Weeping Lady of Latin American folklore. 
the two structures bear some architectural similarities, suggesting Blue Moon Tower was possibly contemporary to the creation of Bir Black Island, or at least that the style of construction was relatively common then. The official design works states about Adaro, looks after the protagonist who has no known family. This is confirmed in one of his dialogues with the Risen. You'll have a home here with us always, come what may. A recently dead cockatrice can be found before honor and treachery on the bridge to the Way Castle, along with Sir Rustum, Sir Morrison and Sir Tullius, who either discovered or killed it. If you examine it, it says it almost feels still alive. This is actually the same one that attacks the city when you return. In North Face Forest, one can hear noises similar to that of a monkey, but they are actually kookaburra calls. There does not appear to be any way to drain the ward of regret, nor does there seem to be any readily apparent reason to do so. The cup that his grace knocks over as he falls is an open cup shape cradled by a stem that comes up over the bottom of the cup in the shape of a dragon's claw. It presumably reinforces the image of the duke as the dragon's bane, which of course is a complete lie. The arena where you fight Grigori is an unknown location, and it's a mystery where it's located in Grancis exactly. However, the fact it's called the Tainted Mountain Summit suggests a relatively close proximity to the Tainted Mountains itself, and likely in the same general location. When you give Caxton or Madeline a gold, silver or bronze idol, they in turn give it to the weaponsmith. It's unknown who that is, but the bronze idol in his home suggests that the Dragonforge could be the weaponsmith. It may be that God King Leonard was ruler of the ruined city at the Tainted Mountain just beyond the temple. Furthermore, if the events in Grancis are cyclical, then it may be that the city was destroyed in a cataclysm like that which destroys Grand Soren at the end of the main quest. This is unlikely, as God King Leonard is known to have taken the dragon's bargain. It's actually hinted in some materials that he may have taken it more than once. He is known to have predated Savan by only 50 years, and the Tainted Mountain Temple was in pretty terrible repair by that point. The other side of the Shadowfort Gate is actually a series of cut content, an entire half of the map they never got to make. There is a monument at the front of Bitter Black Island, but in the texture files, this monument is actually called Grave. This is probably Olros, since she was his beloved at the end, and the one who died. Due to budget cuts, approximately 60% of the original content intended for Dragon's Dogma was removed or never even created before the final release. Some say he was sent to purify Bitter Black Island, most likely an arisen. He may or may not have served the faith, or more likely the elemental gods. What's interesting is that he controls a dragon. It seems like they died at the same time, as if they killed each other. Further amusing, as arisen are known to change into dragons after dying, it's possible the Dark Bishop was in fact the sorcerer's pawn of the arisen who may have become the dragon he fights alongside. The Duke is afraid of what the Arisen might reveal, and sends him on a series of dangerous quests in hope of getting rid of him and preserving his grand lie to the people. At the bottom of the Everfall lies an area known as the Flame Servant's Throne. The exact location of the throne, or if it even is a literal throne, is a mystery. It could be the large open offering pit, or it could have formerly resided in a side hall, or it could simply be a symbolic name. After the corpse of Daemon decays, it leaves behind a person made from a dark grey substance. This person goes back to the rift. Most likely Ash's nihilism and grief became their own entity when he got changed by the dragon. This entity is Daemon. In the first fight, Ash's soul was set free, and in the second fight, it's Daemon itself. There is a theory that Solomet put his soul inside the Worm King's ring in order to cheat death. The ring would either get to the Arisen or the Duke, in which case the ring is kept safe, 
He expects neither of them to destroy the ring. However, his finishing cries suggest he was not finished if this was the case, or perhaps it was trickery. Another theory, though not explicitly stated, is that Solomon created the Worm King's ring. It is speculated that Solomon sought to use the Worm King's ring in a ritual that would convert him into a lich, granting himself immortality. That would mean the ring, its theft and its return were all part of a cunning plan entirely created and planned by Solomon in order to achieve immortality and escape the destruction of the dragon. And yet all plans may go astray. Solomon never seems to reappear and the ring, eventually rings, function across multiple ageless cycles. It would seem, if he succeeded, then he became imprisoned in utter solitude for countless eternities. And that, as they say, is just the tip of the iceberg.